How's it going, Miami? Bitcoin Miami, my name is Bruce Fenton. I'll be MC for the rest of the day. Grab your seats, we've got a great panel coming up to start it off. The topic is Bitcoin. Anybody wanna hear about Bitcoin? <laughs> Bitcoin, options and derivatives. Rich Rosenblum is running a little bit late. He has notified us that he is uh, stuck in traffic. But I'll introduce the rest of the panel and then Rich is gonna join us after we start. Shilang Tang, CIO of Ledger Prime. That's the kind of welcome I like. Come on out. Oh. There you go. Oh. <laughs> I'm in Gomes, CEO of Paradigm. And this panel is going to be moderated by Tyler Evans, who is co-founder of BTC Inc. and managing partner of UTXO. Let's get my hand. Thanks, Brady. All right. Hello, hello, everyone. I uh, <coughs> uh, hope we're not going to put you all to sleep after that uh, lunch that was just served. But we're here today to talk about uh, Bitcoin and options and derivatives, and we've got some of the best people in the world to do that. So I'll uh, let these guys kind of introduce themselves a little bit more, talk a little bit about their company and how they uh, interact with the options market to set the stage here. You want me to go? You want to start off, Anand? Sure, sure. Um, well, thank you, guys. Nice to be here. Uh, my name is Anand Gomes. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Paradigm. Paradigm is an electronic institutional liquidity network, uh, and our focus is options. So what we do is we provide on-demand access or platform so p institutions can get, get on-demand access to liquidity. And I happen to be working with both of these gentlemen here, so super happy to be here today. Uh, my name is Shalang Tang. Um, spent most of my career in derivatives trading. Uh, we launched Ledger Prime in 2017. We're basically a uh, multi-strat quant fund, um, focused exclusively on you know, digital assets. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we specialize in, in derivatives, so futures, perps, options, and obviously work a lot with Anand and you know, Rich, who's not here. Um, but yeah, you know, excited for uh, the space and you know, continue to see uh, how it'll innovate into the future. And uh, <clears throat> for ourselves with, with our fund, UTXO Management, we do trade in some of these markets. We trade on Paradigm. We trade with Ledger Prime. Um, so we're not in it as deep as these guys are, but uh, uh, you know, have seen some of the opportunity and also some of the uh, uh, pitfalls that come with the derivatives market. So I guess to, to kick off this conversation, um, let's just kind of lay the groundwork a little bit. Uh, maybe, Shalani, do you want to just kind of give an uh, uh, overview of the different um, derivatives that exist for Bitcoin and talk a little bit about kind of how that market has evolved? Yeah, um, you know, the, the market right now is, is really kind of um, bifurcated in a way between, I would say, kind of U.S. onshore regulated and kind of the offshore um, differently regulated, you know, markets, right? So like the U.S., we have, you know, CME, Ledger X, backed. Uh, offshore, we have you know a, a slew of exchanges, right? You have, you have Deribit, Binance, you know FTX, um, and, and you know Huobi, and, and basically a ton of others. Um, in the U.S., right, you, you generally have uh, obviously aside from spot markets, you know you have um, the futures markets, uh, Ledger X, CME, Vact. Um, uh, you know those are pretty standard kind of contracts that exist in uh, other asset classes as well. And then the offshore, you know, you have these perpetual contracts, which are kind of like CFDs, um, but, you know, they're pretty unique to, to you know, the crypto world. Um, and they represent a huge amount of, of the, you know, existing volume, uh, 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 you know, in, in crypto and, and specifically in, in Bitcoin derivatives, right? Um, in the option space, you know, you have uh, on the offshore side of Deribit, you have Bit, uh, pretty standard, uh, cash settled. Um, I mean, Bitcoin denominated, but you know, they're not physically settled, right? Uh, in, in the U.S. side, you know, Ledger X is physically settled. Uh, and then you have this whole world of OTC derivatives as well, right? Um, Bitcoin, but also, you know, other, other tokens as well. Um, so that, that's generally how it's, it's bifurcated. And then also in DeFi now, mm -hmm. you know, the DeFi space is growing yep. extremely fast. And all the innovations, you know, they've basically taken what exists in the traditional world and also in, you know, the traditional crypto space and then now move that to DeFi. There's a lot of really cool 
interesting things the Legend Prime plays in that world as well. But yeah, it's super exciting. And, and maybe if we could just take a, a step back for the audience too, like what are these instruments generally? Uh, like why should people care about them? How are they relevant to the, the conversation we're having today? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's all about like it's risk profile. I like usually like to view these things, you know, risk and investment profile, right? People, you know, have an, a view and they have a tailored investment or risk uh, view and they want exposure for, to that, right? And derivatives, generally sort of allow you to tailor whatever view you have and then gain exposure to that with, with you know, using some combination of that. One of the things we specialize in on our platform is the ability to do that. You can you do multi-leg strategies, call spreads, put spreads, strangle straddles, you know, uh, delta neutral strategies, things like that. And so yeah, I, I, I look at it from the perspective of you know, it's people generally have a view, and depending upon who you are, if you are money manager, OTC desk, you know, hedge fund, etc. Like, there's you know, a, a sort of wide spread of, of market participants, and um, so it really comes back to like, what is their mandate? What are they trying to do? And um, if they want a more tailored view, then you sort of go towards the the, the derivatives markets. And and you touched on a few of them, you know, hedge funds, OTC desk, but who are kind of the main uh, players in, in these markets are, are who can you know, benefit from, from using access to these derivatives the most? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's a wide spectrum of people. Um, you know, we see our platform is very institutional focused. So mm -hmm. we have you know, funds like yourself, market makers, OTC desks, uh, lenders. Um, lenders is a huge, huge part of uh, derivatives trading generally and options trading specifically because they have, um, you know, they're lending out, you know, crypto or, 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 or you know, stablecoin in some way, and, and they have all this crypto sitting on their balance sheet, so they need to hedge that risk. So, the, you know, generally they're long risk reversals, which, which means they need to protect the value of the collateral on their balance sheet, and, but they also do things such as structured products, so effectively it's just, you know, selling vol in some way, or, and, and um, but that's selling calls or things like that. So effectively, you know, they are a huge, <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, Rich. Um, so yeah, so the yeah, so and lenders are a huge, huge part of this space, um, and uh, and then yeah, there's a whole sort of ecosystem. And then what I like to call also is rolled up retail, right? So there's people that face retail companies and uh, retail participants, excuse me, and they offer some sort of derivative, but like you know tied or like wrapped in sort of an easy to use way. Um, you're seeing a lot of this in Asia. And, uh, and then those companies need to hedge their, that risk, and ultimately they come to the institutional market, uh, which is sort of where we, we play. Cool. Welcome, Rich. <clears throat> you want to give a, a quick introduction on, on yourself and GSR and kind of how you guys interact with the derivatives markets we're talking about today? Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Rich. Before GSR, I was at Goldman for a dozen years managing the oil derivatives business. Uh, came into crypto 2013, and uh, GSR is a global trader, uh, investor, market maker. One of our main focuses is on options and derivatives. There's often uh, optionality embedded in our contracts. We have an OTC business where we bridge um, options and derivatives in for bilateral contracts. And uh, happy to be here today, despite being late. Great. Uh, <coughs> and I guess <coughs> um, uh, maybe next, if, if uh, you know, any of you guys could just kind of give, give an idea for our audience about you know, the size of these markets, the maturity of them, how they've developed, you know, what's out there today um, in terms of what you guys are seeing on, on the institutional side. Yeah, I mean, so I can start. I mean, futures, futures is a huge business, right? I mean, uh, well, depending upon the price of Bitcoin, you know, we've seen it trade anything between 250 to 600 billion a day in, in, in volume. I mean, it's a massive market, right? Options are not as anything close to being big. I think max, what I would say, four or five billion a day we, we've traded yeah. um, so far. Um, uh, and that, that has also been fairly a recent development, right? Like up until, like even a year ago, options were not that big. But um, like I said, the institutions have been coming and again, they want exposure to these, this new asset class and they want a tailored view and options obviously gives you a view, view slightly different than just being long spot. Um, and so that's, that's sort of, you know, being a big catalyst for why it's, it's done so well. Yeah, I mean, you look at any other asset class, you know, if you think crypto is an asset class, it's here to stay. Uh, every other asset class derivatives trade 30, 40, 50 exercise of spot markets, right? And, you know, crypto really is no different. It's becoming that way. And options, you know, it's kind of the last frontier of derivatives, um, at least the vanilla derivatives. 
uh, that's you know really going to explode. We feel in the next you know 12 to, to 18 months. Um, so. Yeah, I'd echo similar to that. I think there's there's usually this sequencing where where options and exotics markets uh, come later. So I think you have spot, the rest of the ability to to lend. Then you have futures, and then come options. And I think that. Uh, there's nothing about this market that it means that options are going to stay, you know, lighter than other derivatives or lighter than the spot. I think it's more of just a uh, timing element, and especially when uh, having dealt with corporates for a living, corporates tend not to want to use instruments where they have a, a one-day uh, expiry, whether it's a future uh, or an option. So I think it's these custom products that are products that are help uh, bridge corporate interest into the space, and it takes a bit more, you know, dedicated expertise by companies like the, the three of ours to, to be able to build the products that uh, allow larger corporates and sovereigns to, to come in and um, be, be actioning into the, uh, the products. <coughs> yeah, so you, you mentioned in, in typical markets you see maybe the derivatives trade 30x spot. What does that look like for Bitcoin today? How does that compare re relatively? Uh, it's probably like... Five to ten x, yeah. Time? yeah, probably good. Yeah, good uh, rule of thumb. Yeah, at least for now, but that's again, it's changing quite quite rapidly. And, and so that's part of why all you guys are so bullish on the continued expansion of the yeah. options and derivatives markets, right? Yeah, yep, exactly. And we haven't even touched on like you know the more uh, popular instruments that exist in traditional markets, like a VIX equivalent. Um, or like the many structured products that exist in, in traditional assets that haven't really penetrated, uh, you know, crypto and, and Bitcoin yet, right? So once those start to um, come, that, that would even add more growth and Yeah, and that's uh, all liquidity. on top of what already we just described. So, I mean, mm -hmm. there's a long way to go in, in this space. And, you know, companies like GSR do a really good job of, like, figuring out, like, what a company needs. And we started talking about, you know, um, like corporates, have a uh, risk management uh, motivation to come into the derivatives markets, right? Investment houses have an investment mandate or, or, or view, and companies like JSR does an amazing job of trying to figure out, okay, what do you need, and like, how do we sort of come up with a derivative to sort of match what your needs are, and then we sort of deal with the complexity on the back end, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's like I said, lots of, lots of promise, for sure. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that for a little bit. Um, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned some, like, a, a volatility index, some structured products. Where do you guys see kind of the big holes left out there to fill, or what's the you know new exciting uh, products that are going to be coming to market, or that you're seeing demand for some of your clients? I, I think that what makes this space unique is that there's there's uh, both a highly regulated side and then a more more retail side, and uh, even though there's been retail interest in spot and derivatives, I think in options we've yet to see a, a DeFi play in options. There's over a dozen groups that are they're working on it. Mm -hmm. I think in the same way we saw this huge surge in index volumes start about roughly a year ago. I think we're about a year behind in options. So in the next year, I think that's going to be one of the things to watch. Um, <clears throat> so I guess uh, uh, one of those million dollar questions out there that uh, I get a lot that a lot of our, our readers at Bitcoin Magazine ask, uh, how, talk a little bit about the interplay between spot and derivatives, and, and does the, the tail wag the dog or, or vice versa? I mean, you need a robust spot market first, uh, and that's, that's why they call it derivative, right? You need a robust spot market first to even introduce, you know, derivatives, right? And then you start to talk about volatile products like a VIX product, but you need a robust derivatives market first before you can introduce those products. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, ultimately, on a, it depends on the time frame, right, in, in my opinion. If we're talking about like short-term intraday um, time frames, you know, a lot of the times it's, in my opinion, at least derivatives, you know, futures, um, options are on expiration, hedging, um, that drives a lot of the, the short-term movement. But over the long term, right, you have Bitcoin, it's a hard asset, there's only limited supply. And so if the demand is there from retail institutions um, to soak that supply up, you know, there's only so much that derivatives can, can do, right? And, and so in the longer term, in my opinion, it's still about, you know, the, the spot markets and the demand for the, the hard asset, but on a shorter time frame, intraday, um, you know, uh, derivatives often definitely drives a lot of the price action. I mean, you also see this in the, in the traditional markets where, like, 
options volumes have become so huge that like the you know the delta and the gamma effects of of, of you know dealer hedging, mm -hmm. you know people track that now because you know options markets are you know some some big num number multiple of the spot market and you know they all have to ultimately hedge using the underlying, and so you know, the spot market now is like subject to the gyrations of these like huge, you know uh, these forces. So yeah, I mean ultimately I think if there's if there if there's two markets that exist you know in in which are contingent on sort of each other, they're sort of, inev it's inevitable that one will affect the other. I think the size has a lot to do with it, you know, like whichever market is, is like bigger, mm -hmm. will tend to obviously, you know, have a more outsized impact on, on the other market, just because if there is interplay, then obviously size is a multiplier by which, you know, that relationship is governed, right? And so, um, so yeah, I mean, I tend to share Shalane's view that, you know, derivatives definitely have uh, um, a huge impact on, on the spot market, but then also, it, from time to time, you will see, you know, where like you'll see like a spot red rally where institutions are coming in and, and sort of buying up Bitcoin, and you're seeing volumes on Coinbase sort of increase, and then sure. and then the derivatives market sort of react, right? So I, I tend to think of it as like this dynamic relationship that is sort of changing constantly. <coughs> How about even with uh, you know the events of the the past couple of weeks, <laughs> the the sell off, the kind of leverage wipeout. Um, how how do the have the derivatives markets kind of adapted to um, the the equilibrium point we're at right now? I, I'd say you know, in general, uh, in, during a maturation process, you think that you know more more tools would make things more uh, efficient and more transparent, uh, but it always comes at, at some type of cost. I think even though uh, the advent of derivatives has made it so that people could get the, the same outcome out, but have it uh, cheaper, more, more efficiently, um, have it happen more quickly, I think that there's also added volatility in some cases. So I think that uh, futures have allowed the ability to have you know, retail other participants borrow internally from the marketplace, um, you know, able to get long four trillion, even though there's only two trillion of, of, of cash contribution because they're, they're borrowing and having leverage within the space. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, and the way derivatives can make future risks become prompt, you, know, you can sort of see the future with how people are trying to bet today in a, a futures market in a way you can't with spot. But I think one of the weaknesses of that is that if the market is uh, over levered and oversaturated in a specific trade, like being long Bitcoin futures and options, you, know, you can have a, a bigger fall than you otherwise uh, would have. So maybe we, we got to 60,000 quicker than we should have, but the downside from that is we, we fell right down to 30,000 quicker than we, we should have had. Well, one, of the, one of the other things that makes everything sort of worse in crypto is, is just, you know, cascading liquidations. Right. Right? Like, you know, if, if the move is, like, the, one of the nice things about the orderly, the, or the, the traditional market is, like, the concept of circuit breakers, right? Sure, sure. Circuit breakers exist for orderly liquidations, right? So that, you know, and if you think about it, liquidations are account transfers. In crypto, because the market never sleeps and the, 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 the exchanges need to get out of these positions, the sort of what the market has sort of come to is this idea of taking liquidated accounts and jamming them back into the order book. And that has the unfortunate effect of sort of accelerating the move right. in whichever direction the market is you know, going up or down. And that sort of, you know, and then of course, there's more people get liquidated at those lower levels, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a terrible sort of problem. Now, this is a little bit of a shameless plug, but we, we, we're working we're working actually on a solution where effectively we are working with exchanges to, to deal with liquidations away from the order book, right? So talked about market infrastructure evolution, like, you know, we think this is like one of the steps where effectively the, the exchanges, instead of taking that order and jamming it back into the order book, they can run it as a liquidation auction, like it's an RFQ with a set of dedicated market makers. And then once, the, you know, at a, the price is cleared, we, we then clear it back into the order book, right? And of course, the, of course, we think obviously we're biased because we're building the solution, but you know we think it, it will ultimately help dampen you know market volatility, uh, which is just quite unpalatable, right? <laughs> in in this, like nobody likes that that sort of volatility. So yeah. hope, we're hoping we can we can help you know mitigate that some of that. Rich, you you uh, mentioned a little bit kind of the leverage in the system and how users are able to borrow internally, and how that basically. Uh, drives the cash and carry trade or the, the funding rate trade for um, Bitcoin, which are, are two kind of aspects, you know, the, the steepness of the Contango curve that 
don't make a lot of sense to people looking at this with a traditional lens. Can you guys talk a little bit about kind of why that curve exists, why that funding rate exists, and, and what the opportunity is there? Sure, I'll, I'll kick it off and say that uh, if you look at mining as a, an industry, you know, you know, Bitcoin, crypto mining, you know, it's a high return business. And so if this is a business that's returning you know, triple uh, digits of return, they can comfortably borrow in the double digits. That's quite different than traditional finance where rates or these risk-free ranks are in the, you know, near, near zero or negative, um, depending which country you look at. So I think that mining is one of the m most basic ways to create a return, as well as DeFi, which is um, so far more you know, Ethereum-based. It's another way to create, you know, a, a higher interest rate to return. So I think the base level of interest rates in crypto is significantly higher um, than traditional assets based. So that makes it interesting space to look at, but also confusing because it, there is some currency components um, to the space, even though people are looking at it as more like a, a gold, I think there's you know, underlying interest rates that are much higher than traditional assets. I think that's the main driver behind these trades work. It's basically like having a, a trade in the fixed income market and owning a bond, the bond is gonna have a return. You know, it's a corollary to what you're really doing effectively in the futures and funding trades. I think it's interesting to see how it, it differs between the different venues, right? It's not just like a straight, you know, 10, 20% carry um, between, let's say, CME or Deribit or Binance, right? I think CME, um, you know, the past couple of months at least was, was a bit lower, um, actually a lot lower um, at kind of the peak versus like a Deribit or some of the offshore, you know, um, you know, venues, right? And kind of that tells you a bit about the type of activities and, and flow and participants. Um, you know, I think in the U.S. side, a lot of the institutions have started to take advantage of, of that cash carry trade. Um, whereas offshore, with the cost of funding and, and opportunities a lot higher, people really aren't, they don't really care about like a 20% return in cash carry, right? When you can get like 100% in DeFi. Um, so not interested in, in doing these, you know, you know, cash carry trades like, um, you know, 20% isn't enough for them you know, annualized. So um, you do see these rates kind of defer between the different venues um, as a result of the participants, you know, on these exchanges. Uh, <clears throat> you mentioned a little bit kind of the, the bifurcation of the, the Eastern versus lo the Western markets or the U.S. versus the overseas. Uh, where are we seeing the, the <clears throat> growth right now and, and which markets are you guys most bullish on? I mean, as a start, as a platform, you know, the overseas markets are just growing like crazy, like I mean, it's quite absurd, like how fast they're growing. So, um, and the U.S. markets are growing too, but you know, it, it's it, they're not growing as fast as you know any of the top ten derivatives exchanges in the world, right? Um, a lot also has to do with like the the general pace of innovation, right? These overseas exchanges are, are in, and companies and then you know anybody operating crypto generally doesn't isn't like encumbered by you know regulation and, and things like that, like. They think of an idea, developers come together, they build, they put it on the internet, do an airdrop, boom, you're in business, right? right? And, and then, you know, 99 of those projects fail, but like one out of those 99, like it you know, you know, grows into something like Uniswap, which is, you know, crazy, right? And so, um, yeah, I think, you know, regulation has a lot to do with it. And like, you know, if, if, if there's a force like that sort of slowing a space down, then of course capital and, and you know, people are gonna move to where like, they're not going to, and that's what you're seeing, a lot of people sort of moving overseas, which is obviously not very good for, you know, the U.S. as an economy because this is, you know, this is a real driver of, of jobs and things like that. Mm -hmm. I throw out there that I think it's a, a bit of a difference between income versus uh, equity value creation and looking at Coinbase versus uh, finance. That's not as clear what finance is, uh, equity valuation would be today, but I don't think it would be a surprise if they um, creating more uh, more income and more profits. Than, than Coinbase. Mm -hmm. Well, we're uh, almost out of time here, but I guess <coughs> I'll ask each of you guys maybe leave our audience with, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, uh, outlook or a prediction for the rest of the year if you want to, or kind of what you're most excited about happening in the, the market or the derivatives market right now. Uh, 
spent some time in highly cyclical markets, and I think that crypto certainly is one of them, and the cycles have been vicious. Um, but I, I hold the belief that we're in a different cycle now than we've been because there was a lot of talk of institutions coming in 2017, but I think in 2021, they're actually here. And I think that the dips are going to be bought. I don't think we're starting a new you know, bear cycle. I think we're going to continue to, to move, move higher in the coming months. Super cycle. Yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, just to uh, add to that, I think the institutions are here, right? We, we've had conversations with, you know, super traditional assets, you know, tr traditional funds or, or prop trading firms that are, you know, very, very sophisticated, right? And, um, you know, they're, they're looking at the space and derivative space very seriously, if not already in it. So, you know, the competition is here. Um, they're already in the space. Um, so, you know, it's, it's exciting, but and also for, you know, crypto native firms and, and funds like us, um, you know, the competition is really going to, you know, start to heat up. Yeah, banks, and the, everybody's getting their toe wet, right, in this space. I, I'll take a little bit of a different view. Like, I'm most excited about, you know, the infrastructure in this space. Um, you know, crypto, one of the nicest things about crypto in general is, you know, you, you got a fresh start, right? You, the, you don't have to deal with legacy technology. And so the rails that, you know, people in this space have built, including us, you know, are just fresh. They're using the best technology, right? These are just completely distributed systems. Uh, operating at scale, handling, you know, really sizable volumes. Um, and so, you know, I happen to think that in my view before this, before I sort of, you know, got into, you know, building paradigm was that, you know, crypto is this new asset class and yeah, it's going to be, once legitimized, it'll be absorbed into the traditional asset all allocation framework, right? People will start allocating in buckets and it'll find itself on exchanges and people will trade it and et cetera, et cetera. You know, my view has since changed because, because crypto had a fresh start, the infrastructure that everybody built in this space is just better. It never had to go through the innovation cycle, the stepwise incremental cycle that evolved from like the telephone, which is like brokers, you know, talking, saying, hey, I want to buy, you know, X shares of GE or whatever, right? right? And, and, and I think that's the most promising because, because these rails are just better, you know, I ultimately think that it will absorb, you know, the, the capital market uh, asset classes because it's just like the internet, right? It came about. You know, and it's just better, and so people are, you know, move to it. It took some time, sure, and there's a lot of inertia that'll, you know, retard that some of that growth. But ultimately, I, I think I'm most bullish about that. All right, you heard it here, folks. Let's give these guys a round of applause. <laughs>